Welcome. Um, I'm, I'm a bit nervous. I've been giving this speech before, but never to what I presume to be my peers. I've been talking about this to policymakers, and that's quite different from this crowd. It's about electronic patient records. But first, I want to announce something else. After almost 10, no, more than 10 years, this really, really big fight between Scientology and uh, Access for All, an inter uh, internet provider in the Netherlands, and myself over websites containing so-called secretive material has finally been resolved. The whole fight has been all over the net, but the fact that we finally won has not been. And I'm so relieved. After 10 years of court cases, we're over and done with. Supreme Court has spoken. We're done. We have won. <laughs> this book on the electronic patient records that I made is part of a new series that I'm publishing. Uh, it's going to be six books in three years. It's all about the social effects of technology. Uh, uh, we would like to write about underexposed subjects such as these electronic patient records. And we always try to sort of mix theory and practice. The first one was about, about electronic patient records. The second one will be about the economics within gaming. And the third one will be about Web 2.0. And for the rest, we have as of yet no clue. If you have any ideas, you're most welcome. Why a book on electronic patient records? The whole debate about them has been going on for at least 10 years in the Netherlands. But there has been no public debate whatsoever about its premises, its goals, its whys, its hows, th the whole implementation, what should be in them, who should access them. There has been no public debate whatsoever. Well, it's a really, really important subject. Um, newspapers have not been doing much more than just sort of progress reports, uh, press releases. The Minister of Health signed a new uh, um, uh, contract with so-and-so. That's the kind of information that we've been having in the Netherlands about this really big uh, project that's going on. At the same time, you can see that all the policymakers have this sort of absolute faith in technology. This new technology is going to solve everything. It's going to be the new Valhalla. It's going to be the new heaven on earth. So what I wanted to do was to examine the premises. And actually, as a sort of hidden agenda, I, I hoped to help to resensitize people to issues regarding privacy. We all think that privacy is dead, but I do think and do believe that in matters of health and finances, people do value their privacy quite a lot, and actually more than we think. So this, I thought, was a nice subject to make people a bit sensitive again about privacy. The whole idea behind this electronic patient records uh, can be summed up as, uh, in this way. Everybody hopes to make medical information more accessible nationwide. So instead of just my GP having my information, um, GPs all over the country can access my medical records. Um, also, because they can access it at the same time, real time, um, they all can share the same information. By now, my GP can send information to my specialist. My specialist can send a letter back, but by the time my specialist gets the letter from the GP, things might have changed. In this, in, in, he might have entered new information, which, if it's all done by letter, um, is really difficult. So, so this whole idea is that everybody can access the same information in real time, without too much delay, without paperwork, and thereby also the government hopes to enforce cooperation and sharing, which becomes more and more important because the Dutch have embarked on this really big project of um, making, well, not healthcare, but the uh, fina um, financing of healthcare um, a bit more privatized. And so by now everybody is competing over patients, which also means that people are a bit less prone to share information than they were a couple of years ago. So this uh, electronic patient record is also meant to reinforce cooperation amongst doctors. So to sum it up, it would reduce bureaucracy because there would be less paperwork. It would increase efficiency because everybody had actual real-time information. Thereby, it would, re would reduce medical errors, um, as such as giving people the wrong medication, not knowing that some other doctor had already given them uh, medicine A while you were prescribing medicine B, which actually conflicts which en makes people end up in the hospital. So that kind of medical errors would be reduced. And thus, in the end, it would reduce costs. That was the whole government aim. This is sort of uh, a description of the old situation. You have all these people, all these institutes, pharmacies, specialists, um, 
laboratories, GPs, uh, physiotherapists, all communicating with one another over your records, and everything goes by mail, snail mail. Uh, sometimes they use Edifact, which is a sort of, um, well, it's not email, but it's sort of electronic message, which is coded in a certain way. But uh, that's, first of all, it's very expensive. Secondly, it's slow. Thirdly, it needs the cooperation of both. So my GP can only get the ad effect message from my specialist if he first asks for it, and then the, G the specialist needs to agree, and it's not done in real time. So this is all a very, very slow way of communicating. That's the depiction of the old situation. Um, and the prime thing is that in the old situation, information is kept the real information is kept at, at its nexus. My GP has my information that he obtained. The specialist has his own set of information. If the specialist sends information to the GP, he then stores it again. It's sort of, um, he gets this new set of information that he adds. So the one who originated the information that was the specialist by now no longer possesses the information that he sent out. In the ideal situation, Everybody keeps the information that they have, and others can just access it. They can browse through it. They can uh, retrieve it, but they can't change it. So my GP can look at the information that my specialist has, but he can't change it. Only the specialist can do so. The whole idea about these electronic patient records is this um, yellow box. That's the so-called national exchange point that was to be implemented um, in a week, January 1, 2006. All specialists, GPs, laboratories can communicate with one another through this national exchange point. That was the general idea. Um, and not all of them are ready yet to be sort of connected to this national exchange point, but one by one they will. And in the course of four years, or at least that was the plan, the whole Dutch nation, medical-wise, would be connected to this national exchange point. One of the problems with this whole system is that patients, of course, needs to, need to be unique. Um, my GP, in his private administration, can use, um, well, can start at patient zero and continue, and so can the GP in the next city. But the moment you have a nationwide system, you need to have a nationwide uh, unification system. Of course, there was quite some discussion and debate about how to go about that. And the previous Secretary of Health, um, Els Bos, said, we will not, under any circumstance, use our social security number to do so, for obvious reasons, such as it um, makes it too easy to link data that's completely unrelated. It makes it possible to, for instance, link your financial data, your tax data, to your medical records, which is something she definitely didn't want to happen. We got a new government, we have a new climate. So, hence, we got this social uh, civil service number that's going to be implemented also January, um, well, that was the original idea, January 2006. Uh, a civil service number for all Dutch citizens, which actually is our social security number. What happens is our social security number is sort of promoted to uh, the civil service number, which then is broken down again in a civil service number for work, taxes and welfare, uh, an education number for education purposes, and a health information, health identifying number for health and child care and youth care. And of course there are risks involved to having, with having one overall number. One is very, very practical, as opposed to um, common belief and actually what policymakers believe as well, our Dutch security number is not unique. There are many, many errors which the moment you translate that same number to the medical domain becomes very, very complicated because it means that while patient A is being checked in and his or her records are being retrieved, if you, if you work under the assumption that that's a unique number, you have no qualms about re-identifying that person. But if that number is not unique, you might end up with the wrong information anyway. And that's a problem that has not been taken care of in the whole deployment, implementation, debate, uh, all the security measures that have been surrounding this electronic patient record system. Our social security number is not unique, and hence our healthcare information number is not unique. 
Of course, we will get the unwanted, the unforeseen, and the unaccounted linking of personal data in various domains. Um, it has always happened. Governments make their reservations. No, 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 we will not do this. But in the end, it very often ha does happen. A very practical problem is also that by having one number that's to be deployed in different areas of life, uh, a same number, you really make it much more easy for people to engage in identity theft. In the US, it's becoming a really big problem. I think that practices such as the Dutch using one overall number for all areas of life actually uh, encourage identity theft in the Netherlands. Of course, we have the political problems. Currently, the law is being extended, the laws on privacy, with regards to data linking, because we're going to have this new civil service number. And actually, it, from its inception, it has been meant to assist law enforcement and investigation, as this quote will show you. This was uh, a quote in a letter that uh, the government sent to a parliament um, in the year 2002. It said that implementing this overall personal number is important to meet the desire to have more means available to link data for purposes of law enforcement and investigation. Remind you, they're talking about health care information number here. Extending the legal possibilities to do so is being considered within the current European privacy directives. Well, that sounds not too comfortable when you know that the whole data retention law is from its inception known to be breaking the current European privacy directive. So this kind of, um, no, 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 it's okay, um, we won't do anything bad, um, trust us, trust us, trust us, is not something that I trust because at the moment the governments are breaking that same law. Already, while this Dutch civil service number is not yet um, uh, implemented in, in law, it was supposed to be done by now, but uh, everything is of course taking a bit more time as per usual. So while there is not a law at the moment, already companies are promoting a wider spread use of the social service, social, I'm sorry, civil service number than is uh, planned. By now they're already arguing that they themselves should be able to use this uh, civil num number for their own administration to make themselves, um, well, to make their own work more cost effective. Um, this is a quote from a sort of uh, uh, organization for companies and the whole press release was, uh, you can see it in the bottom, the whole press release was called Privacy Obstructs Efficiency. It gives you an idea of where we're heading. <coughs> to make it more complicated, the government in the Netherlands has been eager for a couple of years already to introduce a new um, identity card. We all have our passports, which um, will soon be biometric. And the argumentation for that has always been, yeah, but we need to give our citizens a biometric passport in case they want to go to the US, because the US demands biometrics in passports. Not as in, but we want to have it ourselves. No, it's really, it's, it's America's fault. We can't help it. But at the same time, and it's been badly publicized, but it, it has been going on, they've been eager to introduce their own biometric electronic national ID card. Um, and they've been doing so for years. But one of the really big problems is that such an ID card is going to be expensive precisely because of the biometrics. And they could not really explain to the general at large why they sh should have this electronic national biometric card because there was nothing to go with it, nothing that would make it attractive to, um, to citizens. As in, ah, if you once have this new electronic card, you can do so and so and so and so. But suddenly, this summer, the Department of Health came up with this brilliant solution. We're all going to need an electronic biometric ID card so that we, patients, we ourselves, can access our own electronic patient records over the internet and we can consult what our GP has about us, what our specialist has about us, and what have you. So suddenly, there was this first, um, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, application for the ANIC, which made the ANIC suddenly look viable in the eyes of the government, and by now we are going to have it. While at the same time we have this sort of digital ID already in the Netherlands, which is again based on your social, social security number. So you can actually use that to access electronic patient records if 
and that's not a problem, electronic patient record systems would have this possibility that patients can actually look at them, but they don't. That's rather funny because at the same time this ENIC is being sold to the Dutch citizens, is being promoted because it will enable us to look at our own patient records. But no program running at the moment and no program in the making has this possibility at all. So basically we're going to be, um, we're getting something that we can't use, leaving aside the fact that it's going to be a card. And how the fuck is anybody going to use their electronic patient records over the internet using a card? I mean, I can, um, most people don't have card readers. Um, uh, most people certainly don't have biometric card readers. So this whole notion of uh, people being able to access their files is a bit ridiculous. More importantly, there are technical problems regarding the electronic patient records. Um, I'll give a short uh, summary. Of course, we're going to have viruses, and this has actually happened already in the Netherlands. This is one hospital in the Netherlands, Sparno Hospital, that, as they called it, went, um, um, for, well, formally, they went paperless, as they called it. Their whole polyclinic system went paperless in October 2004. And exactly one year, half a year later, in March 2005, they got a virus. They're still not quite sure how they got it. Probably it was through a USB stick or a um, CD that was uh, contaminated. And the end result was that the whole polyclinic could not access electronic patient records for one full week. Quote of the spokesperson of the hospital. Fortunately, some of the specialists still had paper files. Otherwise, they would not have been able to treat their patients. Do you want a system that actually making it possible that no medical data can be retrieved for a week. To make the story more sort of ridiculous, what they had to do was to check each and every computer in that hospital, and it's 800 computers, by hand and update them. The same has already happened in various um, radiology departments in, in hospitals in the Netherlands, but unlike uh, Spina Hospital, none of them went public with it, so it's sort of... Um, uh, well, badly kept secret that this has happened. And, and the same thing happened. It was, again, a virus running on machines, making it impossible for at least a week for, in this case, scans, echoes, MRI scans, and what have you, to be retrieved. We have bugs in programs. Of course, these programs are very, very complicated, and it's very, very difficult to test them. Well, you know, all the, it's the standard problems that you have with big programs. Uh, the National Health Inspection announced in August of this year that there was one problem with one specific program used for pharmacies, for their information systems, but it was a bit of a complicated problem, and actually it was a big problem because it meant that in 200 cases, 200 types of medication, the dosage that would be prescribed was too high. And it was not minor medication, it was stuff like cytostatics, it was hormones, and the rumor is that one person actually died because of this medical error or this computer bug. Of course, we are also going to have data entry errors. Um, that's sort of on the, the, the user side of it, um, but very often you're going to have problems with identification. A very known problem, and everybody who's been not writing about electronic medical records or electronic patient records, but actually investigating what hospitals and GPs and specialists do with them and how the actual use is um, are going about, notices that people are making so many mistakes when entering information. And one of the, the common mistakes is that you get this sort of drop-down menu with your list of medication or the list of dosage, and people just misclick. And suddenly you get the wrong medication. The wrong medication is entered into your files and people don't really notice it. Um, programs are sometimes so complicated that people enter medication in one sheet of a program, one page view. Uh, they don't see that they need to do it somewhere else as well or the other way around and do it somewhere else as well just to make sure. So people end up with twice the same medication. There are quite a number of mistakes that these programs create or that the... Um, uh, the, the bad ergonomics of these programs create, or sometimes it's just misclicking, it's the usual error proneness that you have with information. The stupid thing is that we are being trained to believe 
that computer information is so much more reliable than our own uh, paper files. Everybody is by now being taught this electronic patient record is going to make medical errors less prone. We are being trained. The whole audience is getting this message. Electronic records on patients, on medication, are more reliable, which is stupid if you know that people make more mistakes with them. So you should actually teach people to be very careful with them. But by now we're sort of getting into this mood whereby we um, actually encourage people to not have a double check, which is what you always need to do, especially with programming, and more especially when it concerns medical history. By now, electronic medication programs are the fourth cause of medical errors. People are dying because of this. And the funny, well, sarcastic or ironic bit about this is that the whole thing was intended to remedy those, pro pro those errors. There's yet another problem about the security of patient data. And security means two things. One of them is as in it only is accessible by those who are uh, allowed to do so. But also, of course, this sort of safety of data means the integrity of data. If somebody else is able to access it, you can't trust these records anymore. People may have been able to change it. Viruses may have changed it. And so securing is always about safety and integrity of data. The Department of Health refuses to give any extra money for new software or the implementation of electronic patient records, except for a couple of um, sort of promotion uh, testing uh, programs. So the whole thing needs to be done without a budget. That makes it very, very um, shipshot. The National Health Inspection, who is the one authority in the Netherlands who's able to say something about the medical practice, says, we're not going to set any requirements for the software. That's up to the market. They should do it. Well, I'm not really sure that I should trust the market, especially not if it's a market that allows viruses to enter electronic patient records. NICTIS, which is an institute especially um, um, started to direct, uh, oversee, um, remedy the whole, well, the whole implementation of electronic patient records, says, ah, but the responsibility for data and software doesn't lie with us, it lies with the hospitals, with the specialists, with the general, uh, general practitioners, not with us. Well, they are the ones actually implementing the whole thing. General practitioners very much do not have any clue about uh, software, about programs, while hospitals very often have, well, they have their own software department, they have their own uh, technical department, they have their own um, uh, sysadmins. A GP will not have as much. How the hell is a GP going to check the integrity of his data? How is he going to take care of um, viruses and what have you? How is he going to take care of this? And most of, most of all, very important, we have legacy software. Uh, both information systems that GP uses and that uh, uh, hospitals use are not a clean new set of programs. It's legacy software. People have been using all kinds of programs for a very long, long time, especially hospitals. They have their modules for page, page, patient uh, administration, name, address, database. They have... Um, our registration, they have their cost registration, they have declaration modules, what have you. And it's all kinds of programs added on top of one another um, to the point that it becomes really a mash. Well, it says on the CCC uh, courts, um, Kabel Salat is gesund, but I'm not quite sure about program Salat. That's really what we're dealing with. And to top it off, the health healthcare as a sector is not very computer savvy. For one reason, is, one reason is they don't, don't have too much money, at least not for this part of the department, so they don't ha hire the best personnel. Secondly, the medical health system is based on openness, it's based on this whole notion of sharing information, while the moment you become this sort of deposit repository for um, privacy sensitive information, you need to sort of change your attitude, you need to start guarding data instead of uh, sharing it with others. And that's not something the medical um, uh, area, the medical domain is very uh, well, used to. It's, it's a change of paradigm for them. Safety and the whole idea of electronic patient records is an afterthought. It's sort of icing on the cake. You have all this data, you already have it, then you put some icing over it, and that's your security. Basically, you, you will have a firewall to protect all this data. 
Well, everybody here, I guess, knows that data security is not an afterthought. It's part of the whole process. It's part of the baking. It should be in the flour. It's not the cake. Of not the, it's not the uh, um, whipped cream. So I've been reading about all of this, and I thought, yeah, I cannot say all this, but that's not what well, most people will say. Yeah, but yeah, all your concerns, it's a bit, uh, you're too pessimistic or what have you. So um, we organized a, a hack. I entered into negotiations with three hospitals. Two of them actually agreed to a penetration test, and I was really uh, amazed that I wanted to do so. We got full um, rights to, to do, enter into a penetration test. I got people from the three best companies in Holland to perform this test. Actually, they did it for free. And that's because all of them are old hackers and they still have the old feelings sort of alive. Um, we had quite some fun um, doing it, organizing it, because for them also it was a new area. Um, um, all these companies have hardly been uh, thinking about the electronic patient records as a new safety and security problem. So for them it was fun and it gave them quite some experience as well. So we ended up doing a penetration test with two hospitals. One, a regional hospital that already provides an electronic patient record system for a series of general practitioners, for a re revalidation clinic, and for a nursing home, and of course for its own hospital, which th has a couple of departments and a couple of locations. And the other one was one of the biggest academic hospitals in the Netherlands. The first test, test A, was going to be a completely technical test, just penetration from the outside. The second one was, um, well, we wanted to do social engineering there as well. <laughs> and the results were quite shattering. In hospital A, within a couple of days, we could access all electronic patient records. That was 1.2 million patient files. Actually, we were in that system for three weeks, shoveling enormous amounts of data around, just as a test, left to right from one side of the computer to the other side, they didn't even notice. They did not notice. The problem was, amongst others, uh, they had no competent, comp I can never pronounce this, compartmentalization. Once you entered one database, you could access all the rest. They basically depended on a firewall for data security. How we got in? a MySQL injection. It meant that we could access actually the records of 8% of the Dutch population by hacking one hospital. That we could access this information didn't only mean that we could just see it. Uh, and seeing it was also really, really awful. Um, at one point uh, for my, well, for the book and for my presentation, I had to get sort of samples of what we could get and I could actually order with one of the people working well, for the test, I said, give me a list of this, give me a list of that. And within seconds, it was all coming to my computer. I could just, I could ask and it was delivered. But the fact that we could access it, it meant that we could copy it as we were doing, but also we could delete them. We could have deleted 1.2 million records. More infamous, we could have changed them. And changing is much more, it's less noticeable. We could have changed a couple of blood groups. We could have changed the status of people being HIV positive or negative. We could have changed some value in somebody's blood. And of course, that's going to have huge repercussions, and it's barely noticeable. If I delete 1.2 million records, well, somebody is going to find out. <laughs> if I change the blood group of 2% of that 1.2 million, you won't find out until people start dying because they get the wrong blood group or something, and you won't know why. That's the risk of, well, amongst, there are more risks, but that's really, really, we were shocked. This was information that I could just get. Insurance number, initials, surname, phone, date of birth, insurance number again, street, zip code, city. I got sick, I got nauseous when I got this one. I asked for, give me something, people having diseases. A list Hundreds of people who have been infected with the MRSI bacteria. It's the kind of bacteria that they close uh, hospital sections off because it's um, uh, insulin resistant. Um, name, uh, informed by whom, what to do when he, he or she gets into hospital. It says um, put in isolation immediately, um, um, severe uh, guarding. Uh, 
that's the point when I sort of, I almost started puking and I said, well, let's break down, let's stop this test, this is getting a bit too much. The other one, the social test at the academic hospital, that's one of our hackers, wearing a hospital jacket, sitting behind a hospital computer, and nobody noticed. Actually, um, they did quite some social engineering. Um, they ended up, well, first, they did get into the systems from the outside, so they could hack the systems to some degree, and they got this um, information about personnel, who's working where, who has what phone number, what position, for how long have, have they been so, been there, which proved to be very, very useful for the social engineering because they could pose as system administrators. Um, and one, well, people are so helpful in hospitals, so what happened is um, they would phone people saying, there's been such a fuck up with the system, and I'm not sure, I, all your data is gone. I'm not sure, I perhaps could, if you give me your password, then, um, no. And people would gladly give out their passwords, but being so helpful, being hospital people, well, I got the password of my, could you save his data too? So they ended up having something like 80 passwords. They could access, through these passwords, they could access 8,000 records. Of course, they couldn't print them, or they couldn't, yeah, they couldn't print them, which they wanted to do. And it was so easy to just make a, uh, to make a new printer in the system, which was actually a file, and take out the files that way. Um, so they got all their information on the uh, nice USB sticks. Uh, that's another thing. Everybody seems to, uh, in the Netherlands, I'm not, I'm not quite sure about here, but in the Netherlands, everybody says, yeah, but now you can steal medical records as well, can't you? Very often in hospitals, you see these files lying around. Well, the problem with electronic patient records is they're much smaller. Most of you will own or have seen one of these small iPods, or you have a USB stick, one giga. Well, on one giga, uh, one giga USB stick, you can store 100,000 full electronic patient records. You can just, nobody won't even see it. You can't take 100,000 paper files with you and walk out of a building. So it makes it much easier to steal information and go unnoticed. Actually, this hospital, it was, that's the uh, academic hospital. Um, although the hack wasn't that big, but well, certainly not as big as the other one, um, they were quite shocked, and they immediately took about, well, um, their remedies, their whole uh, re response was brilliant. They actually started training their personnel to a really big degree. They've been talking about it at large. They've set up uh, courses. They've set up um, posters. They're really doing everything that they can to stop this in a sort of nice and gentle and kind way. The response was brilliant. The Secretary of Health about the hack the day after. The privacy of medical data should not be at stake. The stupid thing is, it was at stake, but he sort of refuses it. It shouldn't be, but it is. That's your problem, and he's not going to solve it. Medical data should not be out in the open, but it is. Hospitals are responsible for the enforcement of safety requirements with respect to central, blah, 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 and they should take action. But that is not a matter of money, but only of internal procedures and a proper administrative organization. Of course it's a matter of money. You need specialists. You need to redesign your systems. You need to rethink your architecture, your computer architecture. That is going to cost a fuck of a lot of money. So, but on second thought, at last, November 11, he sent a letter to the parliament and said that the implementation of the National Electronic Patient Record System, which was supposed to be next week, has been postponed with one year. He mentioned the word security 27 times in that one letter. Well, he had never done so beforehand, so I sort of write that off to myself. Um, suddenly, this sort of set of safety rules, um, well, never mind the name, then, well, is becoming the touchstone within this whole new system. Um, so security is sort of being thought about a bit more. Um, there's going to be this new committee within the department, again, rethinking the whole uh, electronic patient records stuff, and the law on medical secrecy might be reassessed. But yet, everything is happening in the wrong way. This Hospital A, the one with 1.2 million patient records out in the open, of course they wanted to have a conversation with uh, the penetration team. How did you go about it? But they sent the system administrator. They should have sent the board, because it's only the board that can make these decisions as in we're going to fuck redesign the whole system. You shouldn't send the system in. It's not his responsibility. He didn't create the problem. He never got the budget. 
So this whole problem is being addressed at the wrong level in the organizations. And well, in, in, in the press there was this, of course, journalists started phoning other uh, hospitals, how is your security? I'm saying one of the biggest uh, Dutch academic uh, uh, hospitals said, no, but we can't be hacked. We have a proper firewall. Well, that was the fucking problem to begin with because they only have a firewall. And it's so easy to enter a firewall, much easier than everybody thinks. In this case, it was a MySQL inject. In other cases, it's another backdoor. And they have the wrong solution. So they come up with this safety norm, this and so and so, but it's far too wide and far too broad. Imagine it's this really thick booklet of, really thick, well, not another booklet, it's a volume, this tome of set and rules that you need to abide by in order to be able to rank as a safe hospital or a safe medical uh, environment. But it's about everything. It's not about computers. It's about whether you have a night porter. It's about whether your plinths are clean. It's about whether um, there is um, some kind of, I don't know, uh, um, uh, healthcare provisions for personnel. And you need to score on so many points. You can, if you have a seven, you pass and you have followed the safety requirements. But you can just pass on other areas than your computers. So basically, if your plinths are really, really clean, they don't care about your fucking computer system because you will still get a general seven. Well, that's not the base for electronic patient records file, is it? Resume, technology is being held as a cure for all. We've had three huge problems in six months in the Netherlands. Viruses, software bug, and a hack of hospitals. Whether it's actually going to improve healthcare is dubious, and actually, I'm not quite sure, not in the next five years. Protection of um, highly sensitive data is severely lacking, and actually nobody seems to really care a hood, and the people who do know um, are not sort of into this medical domain. Um, hackers are not really thinking about it. Um, those people who are security aware are not yet starting to rethink this whole uh, uh, implementation layout of electronic patient records. And the people who are making it have no clue about uh, data sensitivity and data security. And at the same time, this whole electronic patient record thing is politi politically abused. We get law enforcement, we get ANIX and everything on the side, to the point that I sometimes start believing that this whole electronic patient record is, well, not only, but it's, in part, it's, it's a sort of, um, um, it eases other things, other, it, it, it furthers a completely different agenda, uh, that of law enforcement and what have you. That was... The story. I thank you for your attention. If anybody knows. <laughs> if anybody has questions, I'm happy to. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it after. Hello? Yeah. How big do you think the risk is that there are going to be criminals trying to make out money off these problems? Um, I'm not sure, that, but, but uh, I've done some research on what happened in, in other countries, and there are already a couple of examples of uh, people getting medical files and using them to, um, well, for blackmail, uh, selling information, um, and medical information is going to become more and more interesting, especially within bigger companies that um, buy whole new companies. The moment you can say something about the health, general health uh, um, of the prospective new employers or your prospective new very expensive manager, well, your negotiation process becomes a, a, a bit cheaper. In, so yes, I think people are going to use it for money, and it has already happened. The interesting thing is that that kind of information was not obtained, or obtained through hacks, but uh, internally. And of course, you should never ever forget that very often problems with uh, information, uh, it's not people from outside hacking. Uh, viruses very often don't come from outside. Most of the time, the original source is, of viruses is inside, and the people stealing information or abusing information are people inside. Yeah. So it's... Um, but more and more people are working with electronic data, electronic medical data. Uh, insurance companies have a series of rules, but there is no uh, medical secrecy 
rule for data entry people, for sysadmins, for people um, dealing with backups, with, uh, for data storages and what have you. These people by now do not fall under the law of medical secrecy. Um, the, but, well, the, the money that you can gain if you use it for criminal uses, this information, could be quite large. So yeah, it's going to be interesting for some people. Okay, thank you. Um, you referred to, to cases where when people were dying because of, um, of wrong treatment. Is there, um, is there some, something special cases that were pub published or that you know of? No, it's, it, it's um, the fact that, well, the fact, um, this idea that at least one person died of this, because of this bug in pharmacy programs, it's a rumor. And, and the rumor is based on the fact that the health inspection had such an awkward phrasing about the history of this whole problem that you couldn't help but think that that was actually the case. And the, well, I've spoken with the inspection. I am Kampas over there, who's been working on electronic patient records as well, has spoken with them. And they won't say, but you get this feeling that somebody, at least one person has died. Yeah. There was somebody there. Uh, you said that the fourth cause of uh, medical mistreatment is because of uh, entering wrong data. Um, that's only in the Netherlands, or is it all around no. Europe? Um, well, actually, in the Netherlands, there have been no. In the Netherlands, there has not been, been any research about the actual um, implementation, how people work with it, what kind of data they enter, um, because well. W we rather have our illusions sometimes, I think. But uh, there has been quite some research purported in the US. And um, one paper was published in uh, June or July. And that was very shocking. They reported something like 27 different errors that people made at least uh, once per week, but m um, usually much more often per week. And they, well, um, that's one of the, the, the investigations that together um, cause people to, to, to state, well, by now it's the fourth cause of medical errors. And that's international research. Thank you. Um, I have the question, because the picture you, you, you're, you're showing is that we are on a very bad, bad way down, down the hill, or how you could call it, because uh, people are starting to die from what is proposed to be the holy solution for uh, everything. So is there any um, fallback solution from the government? Because if one dies, you could say, ah, it wasn't us. If 10 are dying, you say, ah, it's still our, yeah. uh, it's not us. But if 1,000 are dying because someone hacked yeah. it, or probably millions, yeah. well, I would say yeah. there must be a fallback to say, OK, yeah. get back the paper. Well, some people say that actually people, um, only when um, people are really dying because of the blue screen of death, we will have some kind of change in the whole setup. Uh, no, but the standard answer is, um, no, but we're going to have these electronic patient records because people are dying already. We have this problem of medical errors. Uh, and there has been some research into how many medical errors are made on a yearly basis, on how serious they are. Um, and that has been taken as a sort of projection of, well, this is what we're going to solve. This is how much budget we are going to, um, to not have to spend because we won't have these, these errors right now. But the stupid thing is that these numbers are high, vastly inf inflated. I compared them to the actual numbers of the health inspection of people dying, people having serious problems because of medical errors. And there seems to be no relation between the two, as in actual reported deaths and what, people's, what, what all the research that they use to argue in, in favor of electronic patient records. So it's, everybody seems to be abusing numbers. But yeah, um, the obvious reply is, well, by now people are dying too, and we're going to make that less. And I'm not quite sure whether they actually can, not if they continue in this way. OK, I still have a second question. Um, when World War II was on, on stake in the beginning, um, we as the Germans were very um, 
uh, well, how should you say? Um, you had in, in the Netherlands, you had to register. So um, it was, shouldn't I say good or bad? So you could find out who is one and who was, was, was a Jewish or not. So I'm very um, yeah, surprised that your uh, population allows things like that. So am I, <laughs> yes. Uh, um, but the Dutch, was, um, we have a sort of fondness of bureaucracy. We like paperwork, we like to register stuff. And, um, and sometimes I think, well, the, the government is, hmm, yes, nice, nice playing ground. But yeah, like this. And the, many people in the, in, in the Netherlands sort of, yeah, but as long as I don't do anything wrong, my information can't be abused. But that was really one of the good things about this whole project. Um, the hack of that one hospital was in the news for sort of like 10 days. It, it uh, was on television. There was a debate in Parliament. Almost everybody in the, in the Netherlands knew about this one hack. So it does help to make people a bit... And everybody but, but that's awful. Not my medical history. So it does help to make people a bit more sensitive towards privacy, which is, in the end, a good thing. I think that um, we should round up because... All of you want, might want to go somewhere else. Uh, that is supposed to be the sort of five minutes in which everybody can dash. Unless there's one really important question. And also you can call me, mail me, talk to me afterwards. Yeah?